So um, I was excited when Adam asked me to speak, uh, but he left it way open-ended on what I could speak about today. So I'll be speaking about one of my favorite uh, chapters on justice and maybe one of the most well-known justice chapters in the Bible, Isaiah 58. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about how I got there. Um, so, you know, thus far, as far as I can remember, we've talked about Shalom. Um, we've talked about restorative justice through the story of Joseph. We've talked about God's people and how he uses his people and how he's freed his people and had justice for his people, but also I think through his people. Last week we heard about Moses and maybe a misuse of authority or what I might call an abuse of authority. Um, and so as I kind of thought about these, uh, it, it just made me think that um, all of these themes to me seem really important, right? The fact of Shalom, I'm reading a book right now on Shalom called The Very Good Gospel, uh, Restorative Justice, God using his people really uh, for his kingdom values in the world, which I would say justice is a central part of that. So I was on a Zoom call uh, a couple weeks ago about Beyond Words, which is our, uh, you know, having pastors who repented of racial or um, indifference or inaction to racial justice and uh, had made the commitment for the year, which Adam did and I did, uh, Rachel Sankler. And um, as I was on this call, I was talking to these three African American pastors, and one of them said, you know, we really need to pray for the white church that they can, that they would have courage. And one of the other pastors in that meeting said, you know, we don't need to pay, pray for courage. We need to pray for integrity. And so I kind of, my ears perked up and I thought, well, that's interesting. And so he went on to explain that, you know, what we're asking white pastors to do is to live an integrous life with kingdom values, right? That their life and the lives of their church or their churches would be in alignment with kingdom values. And I thought, but that's very interesting. And uh, I liked what he had to say. So I looked up the, you know, integrity has always been an important word to me. So I looked, <laughs> I looked it up in any case. And it says the state of being whole or undivided. And so I thought, well, that's very interesting. So a church that is pursuing the things that are good and right in the world is a church that is trying to be whole and undivided. And so any case, a couple of days later, I was reading this book called A Very Good Gospel. And uh, the author shared a story. She was on a tour of civil rights and Native American sites throughout the South. And she came to Dahlonega, Georgia. Uh, does anybody know Dahlonega, Georgia? Or what happened there? Well, it was uh, where one of the first places where gold was found in the United States, one of the first gold rushes. I think it might have been the second, but it was one of the first ones. But it was also the home of Cherokee Nation. And so I'm reading this story, which basically says, you know, the Cherokee Cherokee Nation signed a dozen treaties with the United States between 1795 and 1819 in attempts to protect the land and their people. Then in the, in the 1820s, this was a time of great promise for the Cherokee Nation. They were starting to develop their written uh, characters of their language. They drafted their own constitution. They established a capital city. But then in 1828, gold was found in the middle of Cherokee Nation. So for over 100 years, they had been having these treaties with the United States to protect their land. Gold is found in 1828. In 1830, President Andrew Jackson signed the Indian Removal Act, which gave him power to negotiate removal treaties with tribes living east of the Mississippi River. And at the same time, the state of Georgia divided Cherokee's nation land into lots for miners to come mine the gold. And it just struck me that here's the United States not having integrity 
on the treaties it had made. And so it gets worse. And so in 1831, the nation, a Cherokee nation, asked U.S. Supreme Court to grant an injunction against uh, Georgia's punitive laws, which they did. Uh, actually, they, they ruled that they lacked proper jurisdiction, but a group of missionaries went to bat for the Cherokee nation. And eventually, um, the su Supreme Court awarded in favor of Cherokee nation to protect them. However, by the end of 1838, and in defiance to the U.S. Supreme Court, President Jackson coerced treaties, which had resulted in the removal of nearly 46,000 Cherokee, Chickasaw, Creek, Choctaw, and Seminole men, women, and children. And so as I was reading this in light of the, the conversation with this pastor, I just thought, so here's our country has story after story after story, many of whom claim to be followers of Christ, yet made these treaties to protect the lands for certain peoples, only to take those things back when it benefited us. When it when all of a sudden there's gold found, when, when there are resources there that we would like to have access to, we go back on those treaties and we take it for ourselves. And I thought, wow, what a history of a lack of integrity on the part of the United States, our government. And really many of them would be people that we would call brothers and sisters in Christ. So very disconcerting for me. And so in any case, as I was reading through that, I thought, about Isaiah 58, and that's how I got to Isaiah, Isaiah 58. To me, Isaiah 58 is a great example of God calling his people to live in alignment with his kingdom values and to live in alignment and integrous life with what his heart is all about. And so in any case, with that, I'm gonna share my screen and then we'll be off and running. All right, can you see that fine? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, let me go back. Okay, so I'm going to read little bits of this passage, and then we'll talk about it, and then we'll move on to the next section of the passage instead of tackling it all at once. It's Isaiah 58, 1 through 12. Um, Isaiah 58, 1 through 3. Shout it aloud. Do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their rebellion and to the descendants of Jacob their sins. For day after day they seek me out. They seem eager to know my ways, as if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. They ask me for just decisions and seem eager for God to come near them. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not, and you have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed? So in these passages, you know, at first glance, it seems like the people's heart is really not bad, right? I mean, it, it seems like they are, they're, they're doing okay. Day after day, they seek me out, God says through Isaiah. They seem eager to know my ways. They ask me for just decisions. They seem eager for God to come near. But as we look deeper into these first few verses, there are some cracks in, uh, you know, in the life that they are leading. And so it says, they seem eager to know my ways as if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. So right here, we're seeing that, okay, so they seem eager, but their heart isn't lining up with doing what is right. And they have forsaken the commands of God. And then we also see in the questions in verse uh, three, like, why have we fasted and you haven't seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed? And I often 
find that in my life, right? Where, where I'm fasting or praying or waiting on God to move on something. And I'm wondering those questions. Do you not see me? Do you not hear my voice? Do you not hear my, my pleas and my cries to you? And so they were experiencing some of those similar things. And so at first glance, it looks like, oh, Israel was doing pretty well. But then you see that there are these cracks that are forming like, yeah, maybe they're not doing what is right. And they have, in fact, forsaken the commands of God. So uh, if we move on to, to the next few verses, uh, Isaiah 3b through 5, it says, yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please and you exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fast I have chosen? Only a day for people to humble themselves? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying in sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast? A day acceptable to the Lord? So here, uh, God makes it very plain, or Isaiah makes it very plain that, hey, here are the problems with your fasting. You have this appearance of seeking God, but in the end, really, you just do as you please. You exploit your workers. You quarrel and you have strife amongst you. You're striking each other with wicked fists. So these are the people of God, and yet they're fasting and seeking God's uh, heart on something, but in reality, their life isn't lining up with the commands or with, I would say, the kingdom values of God. And um, so why is this fast unacceptable to God? Because they have left sin in their lives untouched. There are things going on amongst them that are not in alignment with God, that are sin. And God is saying, you're not tackling those things. Your self-inflicted religiosity is of no value if it doesn't change you and the way you live. So our fasting, our praying, our worship should affect how we live our daily lives. And that's what was not happening in this verse. They are doing one thing in their religious life and somehow separated that from their daily life where they are not living out those very things. So I would say there's no integrity there. There's not a living out of what you know to be good and right and true. And in uh, verse five, what's interesting is the word humble is really could be translated um, a flick. So is this the kind of fast I have chosen for you? Only a day for people to afflict themselves. So this is an interesting use of this word. So the Israelites are afflicting themselves with hunger. But God is saying there are, and, and we'll go along in this verse. He's basically saying that there are people who are afflicted and hungry, and you're not doing anything for them or to help them. And they didn't choose to be afflicted and hungry like you're afflicting yourself with hunger in this fast. They didn't choose to be that, but they are being oppressed by the religious people of their day rather than being fed and taken care of. So it's an interesting little uh, verse there, or that sentence in verse five, that is this the kind of fast I've chosen for you? Only a day for people to afflict themselves, afflict themselves with hunger, and, and you'll see now that God will call them to care for the afflicted, to care for the hungry. So their fasting is not really an attack on sin, the sin of injustice and their hard heartedness. Um, we see that they're driving their workers hard. Uh, they are putting yokes, heavy yokes on the backs of the poor and they're neglecting the needs of the poor. So now we kind of get to the heart of the text uh, where Isaiah describes what is this kind of fast that God is desiring for his people. And I want to make one comment here. As we get into these verses, think of this more as a 
um, uh, a prescription, a doctor's prescription, rather than say a job description. A job description is something maybe we might do these things in order to earn God's favor or to, um, if we just do this, then God will be uh, happy with us. This is more in line with the, the prescription from the doctor that says, if you do these things, your life will be healthy. And not only your life, but the land will be healthy and the people in the land will be healthy, right? And so it's more of a prescriptive, uh, a doctor's prescription than it is just some way to earn God's favor. That's not what we're talking about here. And so in verses uh, 58, really six through 10, but I'm gonna skip over verse eight because it comes in the next section. It says, is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen to loose the chains of injustice and to untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter when you see the naked to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood? Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and he will say, here I am. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with a pointing finger and malicious talk, and if you spend yourselves in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed. So in this verse, there are seven things that God calls his people to. Um, this is the kind of fasting that he is calling Israel to. The first thing is to lift the burden of bondage. So to loose the chains of injustice, to untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free, and to break every yoke. He is calling them to live as free people and to free people and not to burden people. And that's what had been taking place in Israel. They were placing a heavy burden on people's lives. And God is calling them to actually free people of burdens rather than lay heavy burdens on them. The second thing he calls them to is pretty straightforward, to feed the hungry. Share your food with the hungry. I think that's pretty straightforward, as is the next one. How's the homeless? Provide the poor wanderer with shelter. This was always a part of Israel's culture, is to, you know, take in the stranger. It was an it was a integral part of the culture of that time. And so to house the homeless, to provide for the wanderer. To clothe the naked. When you see the naked, clothe them. To be sympathetic. So um, he says not to turn away from your own flesh and blood. And, and this literally means put yourself in the place and feel what they feel since you have the same flesh that they do. It's kind of in that spirit of Hebrews 13, 3 that says, remember the prisoners as though in prison with them and those who are ill-treated since you yourselves are also are in the body. It's that, that sympathy, that, that care for somebody that is invoked in us um, to feel what others feel because we have the same flesh that they do. Hey, Brian, sorry to jump in i'm i think i'm noticing your slideshow that we can see is is not advancing at first i thought that maybe we were just, just um keeping on the three verses so are you in presenter mode or something i could, yeah now i see what the doctor prescribes yeah but, huh that's weird okay Sorry to, to interrupt, but I was interested in seeing as well. <laughs> what do you see on the screen right now? Now it says Isaiah 58, six through seven and nine, like what the doctor prescribes. Okay. And I can see the little thumbnails on the left too. All right, well, I'll just leave it in this mode then. So, so yeah, so basically lifting the burden of bondage, um, 
feeding the hungry, housing the homeless, clothing the naked, being sympathetic. Um, and the next thing, number six of this list would be put away contempt for others. And so in this verse, it's talking about do away with a pointing finger and malicious talk. And literally it says, do away with the sending of the finger, which is similar in a rude and mean way of, of giving someone the finger. Now, some of you may have similar reactions when you're driving or something, but it's that contempt for other people. And, and you know, he says, do away with that from your lives. All of these things, either engage them or this part you need to put away. And then the last thing he says is to give of your ourselves and satisfy the soul of the afflicted. So in the verse, it actually says, spend yourselves in behalf of the hungry. What that literally means is spend your soul in behalf of the hungry, satisfy the needs of the oppressed or satisfy the soul of the oppressed. And so the idea here with giving of ourselves and satisfying the soul of the afflicted is really, you know, it's not so much about giving our things or our resources. It's really about going beyond that and giving of ourselves. And so God is calling us to not just, not just to care for the needs in, in by giving the things that we have, but, but truly be engaged in this process. In Rewire, we often talk about solidarity with the poor. And I feel like that's what this is about, being in solidarity, being with them giving of your very self. Okay, so Isaiah, uh, he lays this out, that these are the things that God has chosen for you to be engaged in. And he says, if you do these things, this is what will happen. Um, Isaiah 58, 8 through 12. Then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call and the Lord will answer and you will cry for help and he will say, here am I. Then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like the noonday. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the age-old foundations. You will be called repairer of the broken walls, restorer of the streets with dwellings. So again, seven things uh, to point out in these verses. And these are the promised results. If you live this kind of life, this is what you will reap in your life. You will, your darkness will become light. And so it says that your light will break forth like the dawn, your light will rise in the darkness. I think of two ways that this happens. One is the light that we want to be light to the world. And I think that happens when we live in this way, that we're a light to the world, but also the light in our own very lives brightens, right? Our, our, the darkness in our lives is overtaken by the light when we live in this way. So there's a reality into the world. There's also an inner reality in our life. Can you still see? Is it? Yeah. Uh, the second thing is says there will be physical strengthening, strengthening. Your healing will quickly appear. God all around us with righteousness and glory. He says your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. So when we are doing what Jesus said, what Jesus did with the power that Jesus gave us in the spirit, then God says he is moving in on us, behind us, in front of us, surrounding us with love and care. So as you lean into this life, as you live this way, that reality will be a part of your life. Uh, God will continue or will guide us continually. You will call and the Lord will answer. The Lord will guide you always. God will satisfy your soul. He will satisfy your needs, literally your soul, in a sun scorched land and will strengthen your frame. Um, pouring ourselves out on behalf of the poor is the path to our deepest satisfaction. And so God is saying the more you give of yourself, 
the more I will satisfy your deepest desires and needs. Uh, sixth thing is God will make you a well-watered garden. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. So again, this is kind of that paradox in scripture. The more you give out, the more you're filled up, right? And, and you can never outgive God. I remember somebody telling me that when I was a young Christian. You can never outgive God. And so I tried it a couple of times where I gave very sacrificially, and it was amazing. Again, it's not a, prescri or not a, a direct correlation. I do this, so God will do this. But I've rarely, if ever, been able to outgive God. God always provides abundantly. And I think in these ways, as we give of ourselves, God brings the kind of fruit and, and to our life, the kind of uh, joy and deep satisfaction to, within us that our life begins to produce really the fruit of the Spirit. And, and, and those things flourish within us and within our life. And then the last thing he says, God will restore the ruins of, the, of his city and people. Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the old age old foundations. You will be called repairs of the broken walls, restorer of streets in which to dwell. So think about God's restoration of his city, of his people. And I think any of us who live here in St. Paul, or all of us who live here in St. Paul, we, we desire that for our city. We desire to repair those broken walls, the things that have broken in our society and our communities. We desire to be the restorer of the streets in which to dwell. And so having said all that, my, I want to just share a couple things quickly. This symbol is the symbol of our rewire team. And so one caution I would want to mention in light of these verses, again, you know, it's not do these things in any way to, to earn God's favor. Or I would also say that it's not about just doing, it's about being as well. So you see the kind of infinity figure in the, yeah, in the symbol. That is really the ebb and flow of the inward and outward life, right? So we have to care for our inner life, our communion with God, and then our outward life would be the life and mission. So that ebb and flow of that life is I spend time inwardly with God so that that pours out outwardly, but when I pour myself outwardly, it drives me back to that inward life with God. And there's this constant ebb and flow between those two things. We can't live this outward life of mission without caring for our souls and our hearts and our, our inner life. That has to be the foundation from which we give. And then the whole thing is held together, that circle, uh, really represents community or our together life, right? And so that touches all of the inward and outward life as well. And that together life holds us together. So in any case, I thought that was important to just mention that it's not all outward. It's not just all caring for the world. We have to care for the inward life as well. And then I just try to come up with, so if God's asking us to live in to integrity with the kingdom life what are this what is the kingdom of god all about and so i just try to come up with things that i felt and this is not an exhaustive list this is just a list that we have in rewire and i've added to it but equality love forgiveness other centered justice peace grace thankfulness servanthood sacrifice humility giving, freedom to do what is right and good, mercy, compassion, and solidarity with the marginalized. Those are things that I see as being an integral part of the kingdom. And so I have to ask myself, does my life line up with these things? Am I living the kind of life that is in alignment with God's kingdom? And so I would encourage you to think through what are the things that, uh, that you see as part of God's kingdom? What are those things that you see as very integral? And does your life line up 
with those things that God says are deep on his heart. And then the last thing, I just want to leave you with a quote from Richard Rohr. He says, when Christ calls himself the light of the world, he is not telling us to look just at him, but to look out at life with his all merciful eyes. We see him so we can see like him and with the same infinite compassion. So that's my prayer for you today is that just that all of us, that we would have those all merciful eyes to look out upon the world with the same compassion of Christ. Thanks. I guess questions or comments or. So this is not a question or a comment, or maybe it's both, maybe an observation. Um, but something that I was thinking about is it, uh, in the list of the prescriptions for us, they're all very um, like clear and direct things you can do for, you know, feed the hungry, clothe the naked, like house the homeless. And I feel like a lot of, um, <clears throat> In the last year, a lot of the societal conversation has been around like um, systemic level stuff. Hmm. And it just makes me wonder, like, you know, you spent a lot of time thinking about this and preparing for this. So what what are some of the, the connections between these very direct things that Isaiah or God through Isaiah is, is prescribing for us and how they play into systems because like you know hmm. it, right. it government level is oppressing these people and so you know isaiah is not saying oppose the government level oppressor he's saying take care of these actual people and so i'm wondering if that's an intentional thing or do you extrapolate from that and say feed the hungry and fight the systems that cause hunger in the first place or if it's more like no let's actually focus on the, the person and let the systems be well I, I would say maybe a couple things uh here they were the system right he's talking to the the people who are doing the oppressing were the people he was talking to so i think maybe you know it's one and the same here in these verses um I also think, you know, in Jesus' day, what power did any Jew have uh, in a Roman Empire? None. Today in America, we have a different luxury of having power of democracy where we can actually speak into those things. But I would say, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's both, right? You doing the tangible, straightforward thing is super important. And then there are these systems that are, you know, also at play that also need to be addressed. And I think especially in a country like ours where we have the voice to vote, to, to give our voice and to work towards these things, that that is equally as important. So I would say that there should be both of those, but that's, that's my opinion. And I would say in this verse though, it was probably the people were, were kind of one and the same, the people doing the oppressing and the people to stop doing the oppressing and actually care for people. Thanks, Brian. I really appreciated the, the message and it was having me think about um, uh, earlier a week, within the last week, I there is somebody outside of the um, Aldi asking for money. And um, I think it was in your prescriptions I gave the person money, but my heart wasn't like happy about it. And I was very observant of this because it's been that way the last couple of times people have asked for money where it's like I do the thing externally, but I don't feel the internal, like the thing that I feel like God wants me to feel like, yes, God has given me this money and I'm going to give it to you joyfully. And so, um, just sharing that as like I, something 
that I guess I want to pray for. But interestingly, later that day, I was going to the Dairy Queen drive through and um, <laughs> and somebody behind me yelled at me because I didn't pull up immediately. Um, and it was just it, like it didn't make sense. And I just got this idea. I think when I had given the money without a gracious spirit, I had kind of prayed about it, like God helped change that. And later that day, this person like honks at me, like really kind of felt aggressive or maybe they yelled at me, I think. And I just got the idea to pay for their meal. Um, Cause I've heard people talk about like paying it forward and I've never actually done that before. So I just did, but in that moment, like I did have like that spirit of like, yes, giving. Um, and so I just wanted to share that as like the most recent way that I've been thinking about these kinds of ideas in my day to day life. And I'm going to keep praying for my spirit to, to change, um, to give gratefully with Thanksgiving and celebratory. Yeah, that's really good. Uh, and uh, it's a fun story. Yeah. And I think it's something we have to cultivate in our life, right? It's not just like, oh, I do it and the joy is there. I think this is something that it's a way of life that we cultivate and we have to keep cultivating. And the more we live into it, I, I really do believe that will change. But sometimes I'm, I'm the same way. Like I, I expect it to come immediately and I don't feel it. And I'm like, well, where's that coming from? And maybe my motives were wrong. It, that could be an option as well, you know, but I also believe that it is something that's kind of that cultivated and, and grows and lives more and more within us. That was my thought exactly too. Like first you got to start by flexing the muscle and then hmm. the heart will follow. Yeah. 